As we have seen the past couple of weeks, and as I have said to you, the Lord, our God, is like a farmer. And he went into his field, and the Lord, he sowed seed. And as I have said for you the past couple of weeks, no gardener scatters seed on the ground and wishes for that seed not to take root. No gardener scatters seed on the ground and wishes for that seed not to sprout up. No gardener looks at their field and wishes for the crops not to produce anything that they can't go out and harvest. That's the point of farmers. That's what they desire. They want to go out into the field and they want to harvest not just something, they want to harvest and have a good harvest. I say to you today that the Lord, he ain't no different. The Lord, I want you to understand today that he is heavily invested in his field. God, he is heavily invested in his garden. Every last one of us, we are a part of that field. We are part of God's garden. And scripture, I want you to understand, it repeatedly tells us one thing about the Lord that is destined to happen. Tells us that God is coming. Have you heard that God is coming? God is coming and I want you to understand today that the Lord, he is coming to harvest his field. So I ask you today, are you ready? Are you ready for the harvest of God? Will you be, will you be a part of God's harvest? Now I kicked off this series of sermons a couple of weeks ago by taking a look at Jesus speaking about the kingdom of God being like a growing seed. He was speaking to all of those from a boat who had gathered to him by the sea. Today, we will pick up with Jesus sharing yet again another parable to all those who were gathered to him by the seashore. And that parable is the wheat and the tares. In this parable, we'll see that in the 24th verse that Jesus stated that the kingdom of heaven said that the kingdom of heaven is again like a man who sold good seed in his field. Yeah, yeah. Now, we often use the phrase the kingdom of God and the phrase the kingdom of heaven. We often use those phrases interchangeably, don't we? Mm-hmm. We use those phrases interchangeably when we are speaking about the Lord's dwelling place in eternity. Throughout Matthew's gospel, the phrase, the kingdom of heaven is mentioned 32 times with eight of those times appearing in the 13th chapter that we are looking at today. So I guess there must be some significance to the kingdom of heaven. I guess. And of course, I'm saying that sarcastically to show you that there is some significance. We see that John the Baptist in the third chapter of Matthew's gospel, he preached that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. John the Baptist, we know, was the forerunner of Christ, and he was preaching about Christ coming behind him with the good news. When Christ began his earthly ministry, he also preached that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Christ being the kingdom of heaven, coming from the kingdom of heaven, Mm -hmm. he was in the world. And guess what he was preaching to the world about? Mm -hmm. The kingdom of heaven. So yes, heaven is certainly a location that has been promised to us. It has been promised to the poor. It has been promised to the persecuted. Mm -hmm. It has been promised to the righteous. It has been promised to all of those who are of faith. 
However, as we have seen in recent weeks, the kingdom of heaven, it has been used as a phrase to speak of the spiritual condition of our world. The phrase has been used to ask the question, are you ready? It has been used to ask the question, is the world ready for the coming of the Lord, for the coming of God and his reign? Again, I ask you today, are you ready? All right. yeah. mm -hmm. I ask all of you today, are you ready again for the coming harvest of God? Right. Now, Jesus, he taught this parable to speak of the condition of our world spiritually. Mm -hmm. Jesus, he, he desired to, to speak to the state of our world. Mm -hmm. As you already know, as we already know, the owner and the sower of the good seed in the field, again, that is the world, is the son of man. Mm -hmm. And we know the son of man to be Christ himself. Jesus, he then told the disciples there in the 38th verse mm -hmm. that the good seeds in the field, that they are representative of the sons of the kingdom, that kingdom being the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. The sons of the kingdom, they are those who are true, who are faithful, who are sincere believers in him. Right. So we should understand that from that statement, there is some good that is in the field. Mm -hmm. From that statement, there's some good that is growing in the garden of God. All right. All right. In other words, from that statement, there is some good that is in the world. Mm -hmm. That good being all of those that genuinely believe in the only begotten son right. of God. Again, as I said in the Sunday school lesson, there is a difference between good that is of the world and good that is of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That being said, we know that the field, that this world is not in pristine condition. Oh, yeah. Do you know what I mean by that? Yes, <laughs> this world, we know it ourselves. Mm -hmm. We know that it ain't in pristine condition. The world, we say, it is a world of sin. And, and you know how we talk about the world. We say that the world, it ain't getting no better. That's what we say. Come on, come on. We say that, man, this world is getting worse and worse. It's getting worse and worse all the time. That's what we say. Yeah. 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 From the parable of the sower, mm -hmm. we know that three-fourths of the field, right. that in other words, 75% of the field, it's in terrible condition. Some of the surfaces were stony. Uh -huh. Some of the surfaces were thorny. The others was like the edges of the field, the wayside. Yeah, yeah. Where can't nothing good grow. Uh -huh. In other words, not to speak figuratively anymore, 75% of the world, three-fourths of the world, at the least, at the minimum, uh -huh. has nothing that can be harvested by God. Did you hear that? At the minimum, the number is 75%. It's probably higher than that, to be honest with you. It's probably a lot higher than that. Has nothing that God can harvest. Nothing growing that the Lord can harvest. In other words, if I was to say it plain and simple to you, a lot of the world can't be saved and will not be saved. Now, the reason that I have preached about the condition of the world over the past few weeks is because the harvest of God, it is drawing near. Whether you believe it or not, scripture testifies to it. Jesus testified of it as well. The kingdom of God, it is coming. Again, we, we often think of the kingdom of God being stationary, being that place where the Lord dwells. But, but again, John the Baptist, Jesus said it himself. The kingdom of God is at hand. It is drawing near. It is moving. Mm -hmm. 
In other words, God, he sowed that seed with the desire for the seed that he planted to flourish in the field. But sadly, that seed is not flourishing in the field as it should. So what's, why is that happening? Why is that seed, why is it not flourishing in the field? What is preventing, in other words, the seed, which is the word of God, what is preventing the word of God from flourishing in our world? The word of God, again, it is a saving word, but that word, it is not flourishing in our world. Why is that? Jesus, he gives us an answer. He speaks to the why in this parable that we're looking at today. Let's look at the parable again. Here in the parable, Jesus, he explained there, in the 24th and in the 25th verse that after the owner of the field had sown good seed, he said, while men slept, there was an enemy that snuck into the owner's field. And that enemy sowed tares in the field. Now, why would the enemy go and do that? I don't think it take a rocket scientist to answer that question. You know, enemies, they, they do things, don't they? Auntie said they do it just because, but I tell you, it ain't even just because. Enemies don't want to see their enemy prosper. You have an enemy today that don't want to see you prosper. There is an enemy that does not want to see the owner of the field prosper. And guess who the owner of the field is? Right. Yes. The owner of the field is the Lord. Mm -hmm. There is an enemy that does not want the Lord and those who are of his field don't want them to prosper. Oh. Don't want the Lord to prosper. Now, after Jesus had shared this parable with the people, the disciples, they wanted more clarity. They wanted more understanding. And so Jesus, he spoke to the disciples to give them some more clarity about this parable. And we're going to look at that clarity today. Again, as we already know, Jesus was the one that sowed the good seed in the field. And in the 39th verse there, we're told that the enemy that sowed the tares in the field was the devil. Jesus did not try to hide who the enemy was. And I'm not going to hide the enemy from you today. Right. We need to know who our enemy is. Right. All right. The devil, we should understand, sold tares, not just because. The devil sold tares because, again, he does not want the Lord to prosper. Not only does he not want God to prosper, he doesn't want you to prosper. The devil doesn't want you to grow in the field. Now, I want you to pay very close attention to the wind there. I want you to pay very close attention to when Jesus said the enemy sowed his seed. Mm -hmm. Jesus, he tells us there in that 25th verse that it was not while the owner slept. Pay very close attention to that. It was not while the owner slept, but while men, yeah. scripture says, yeah. while men slept. So I want to be very clear about this statement here, because you see a lot of people think that God is sleeping today. Jesus, he was not saying that God went to sleep. As we know, the Lord does not slumber. We know that God, he does not sleep, does he? While men slept. Yeah. While men slept, that speaks to All right. Come on. That speaks to us. Yeah. 
man and woman. That speaks to, to mankind being asleep. Being asleep, I want you to understand spiritually. And, 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 and even more important there, it was after the seed was sown. After Jesus came to the world and had sold the seed, that is the word of God, men slept. Now, if you think about it, mankind's spiritual sleep, actually, it began in the garden when Adam and Eve were asleep to the deceptions of the devil. That's the truth. Now, if you did begin to wake up out of their sleep when the Lord said, hey, I got a law that I want you to be obedient to. I want you to keep that law. Will you keep it? And the children of Israel said, yeah, Lord, we'll keep it. But only if you actually did. The others, they they stayed in bed. Spiritually, they kept on sleeping. Jesus then stepped into the room that was in the dark, right? And flipped on that light switch. You know, when you're sleeping in the dark and somebody come into your room and you turn, they turn on the light, you can hear when that light switch turn on. And when that light hit your, your eyelids, when it's closed, you wake up. It don't take you long to wake up. And Jesus, he came into the room, he turned on that light, and, and many of us, we woke up to the light of the world, right? But guess what? The rest chose to pull the cover over their eyes so they didn't have to look into the light so that they could roll over in their bed and just keep on sleeping. Well, many of us remain asleep today spiritually. Guess what the devil is doing? Scattering more seed, still sowing seed in the field that is God's garden, that is the world. If it is not clear, the devil is trying to ruin the harvest of the Lord. Yeah, like I said, the devil ain't out in the field sowing seed just because the devil has a plan. And his plan is to ruin God's harvest because he knows that the Lord is coming to his field to gather up, to take in. He's coming for his harvest. And the devil is out in the field, dancing in the field as we still stay asleep, sowing his seed to ruin the harvest of God. He don't want God to have a harvest. He wants to have, he wants the Lord to have little to nothing to harvest. I tell you today that there are tears all over the Lord's field. There are tears all over God's garden. For those of you that may be wondering what a tear is, a tear is a weed. It is a weed that looks very similar to wheat in wheat's early stages of growth. Jesus, again, spiritually speaking, said that the tares in the field, they're in the 38th verse, they represent the sons of the wicked one. The tares, they have grown from the seed of Satan. And the seed of Satan is his doctrine. So on that note, because the tares look similar to wheat, that would mean that Satan's doctrine, it is an imitation of the word of God. It is an imitation. It is a fraud of the divine truth. It may look right. It may sound right, but it ain't right. It may look good. It may sound good, but guess what? It ain't no good. And what makes matters even worse 
is where Satan's seed is able to take root and where it is able to grow. Uh -huh. I don't know if y'all caught it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If we look at that, that 26 verse there, mm -hmm. we'll see in the parable that Jesus states that when the grain, when that wheat had began to sprout, that there was something that appeared with the wheat. Mm -hmm. It was the tares that, that Satan had sown. Yes. Yes. That was there with the wheat when the wheat began to sprout up in the field. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think about that statement for a moment, Again, think about on what good ground the good seed was able to take root in. Think about what type of ground that that good seed was able to take root in and on what type of ground that it was able to grow from. It was only able to grow on the good and the fertile surfaces. And so for Satan's tares to be there, that would mean that Satan's seed was able to take root. Guess where? in the good and the fertile ground as well. It was able to grow on the good and the fertile ground as well. I want you to understand that this today speaks to the results of Satan's spiritual warfare against the Lord. This speaks, it is evidence of the spiritual warfare that Satan has waged against God. He wages this warfare, not while God sleeps, but while, yeah. while we sleep. Let me remind you that Paul said that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness. And then this Paul said, he said that we wrestle against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. All right. so Don't overlook that statement. All right. that said that we wrestle against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. You see, Jesus, he spoke of that when he warned believers to beware of false prophets who will come among the sheep in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are nothing but ravenous wolves. So to speak very plainly here for a second here, Satan's doctrine again, it's all over the place. It is everywhere. It is the world's doctrine. And sadly, many people that live by the world's doctrine, they are living by Satan's doctrine. You may wonder, well, how widespread is the world's doctrine? How widespread is Satan's doctrine? Well, let me share with you. Satan's doctrine is in our own homes. Not only is it in our homes, it's in our neighbor's homes as well. Not only is it there, it's in our workplaces. It's in schools today. It's on school playgrounds. It's in all public places as well. But not only is it in those places, it's in the church today. I don't know if you hear me here. I don't know if you hear me. The world's doctrine, Satan's doctrine is even in the church. Paul said that spiritual hosts of wickedness are in even the heavenly places. And I repeat to you, the Lord, he desires to have a good harvest. But guess what Satan desires? Satan desires for the Lord harvest to be ruined. And as I just said a few minutes ago, Satan desired for the Lord to have no harvest at all. And he works hard. Satan, he's a hard worker. I'm telling you. He's a hard worker. Night and day. Satan told God himself when he visited him. When you look at the first chapter of Job, Satan told the Lord, hey, I've been going to and fro. In the world. Looking to see who I can devour. Scattering my seeds all over the place, to and fro, yeah. night and day. Right. Satan said, I ain't going to go to sleep if you ain't going to go to sleep. <laughs> Come on, sir. I hate you. Tell the truth. 
I'm tell you, I, I don't know any gardeners that desire to ever harvest weeds. And, and I, I tell you today, you better believe that Satan knows that. Do you believe, do you think for one second that weeds are going to be a part of the harvest of God? Do you think for one second that the tares of the field will be a part of the harvest of God? Now, when the servants pointed out to the owner that tares were growing among the wheat, we'll see there in that 28th verse that they asked the owner, hey, do you want us to go out there and pull up those tares that's growing among the wheat? Right. You know, that's, that's again, we talked about this in the Sunday school lesson as well today. You know, that's what I do. You know, I, again, I want my yard to be pristine. And so, you know, if I see some weeds growing in my yard, I'm either going to go and get my my sprayer to, to spray the weeds to try and kill them, or I'm going to go out there with my bare hands, dig down in the soil, and I'm going to pull those weeds out. All right. That's what planters do. That's what gardeners do. Right. We don't want the weeds soaking up the nutrients of the good that we have in the field. Right. We don't want those weeds to be trying to hinder any growth. Though pulling up weeds can be helpful to the good plants, yes, yes. there's a danger there. Mm -hmm. You have to be very careful when it comes to pulling up weeds because, you know, if you, you pull up some weeds, you may end up pulling up something else that you don't want to pull up. And, and we see Jesus, he, 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 he touches on that. Mm -hmm. He says there in the 29th verse that the owner of the field responded to the, the servants, the owner said, no, don't go and do that. Don't, don't, don't do that. Don't let's not, let's not pull up anything. Right. Said, don't do that. Lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot mm -hmm. the wheat with them. Mm -hmm. The owner, the owner said, don't, don't do anything. Don't, 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 don't uproot the tares because you might, you might uproot the wheat yeah. with yeah. them. You know, some people, they often wonder, why does God allow evil to exist? Why does the Lord allow evil to exist in the world? Now, that question, it can actually be a good question. If you, if you try to learn about the Lord and you desire to learn about God's love, because there's love behind it. But at the same time, some people try to flip it around. And like I said before, there are some people that, that try to use such a question to, again, imply that the Lord is asleep. Mm -hmm. And if God is not asleep, he don't care about what's going on in the field, that, mm -hmm. that he does not care about what's going on in the world. But I tell you today that that statement, that thought, it cannot be any further from the truth mm -hmm. because the Lord certainly does care about what's going on in the world. Because as I said at the start of the sermon, the Lord is heavily invested in his garden. So why? Why does the Lord allow for the tares to grow with the wheat? Why does the Lord allow the bad to grow with the good? Well, we'll see that it is because God does not want the good grain that is growing in the field to be pulled up before it is ripe. He doesn't want the good grain that is growing in the field to be pulled up before it is ready to be harvested. In my key verse today, we see that in that 38th verse, that the owner said to the servants, let both grow together. Let the bad and the good grow together. The owner said that in my key verse, he said, wait to the servants. He said, wait until the time of the harvest before you go out there and start pulling up stuff. I tell you, there is again a reason behind it. Now, some again will view this as God not caring about the world. Some again will view this as God not caring about evil growing in the field. But again, the truth of the matter is that the Lord does care that there is evil that is growing in the field. The Lord does care 
that there is evil that is growing in the world. But there is something that outweighs that. And something that outweighs that is that the Lord desires for the good grain that is growing in the field to keep on growing so that it can reach its full potential. You see, the Lord wants the good that is growing in the field to stand tall in the field. And as I said last week, the Lord, he desires for the good that is growing in the field to bear much fruit. You see, I repeat to you today that God is love. And in his love, the Lord, he's not going to cut you off from reaching your full potential. All right, all right, all right. God is not going to cut you off before you are able to produce much fruit. Mm-hmm. God wants you to bear much fruit. Right. God is not going to hinder you from bearing much fruit. Oh, yeah. 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 You see, if God did not care about us, he would have simply burnt down the whole field. You know, I done looked at my yard sometimes. I have this old pesky weed that that sits on the side of the backyard that I can't get rid of. My mom knows how I feel about it. I go to that patio window and I look out at my yard and I always happen to just look over at them weeds because they drive me crazy. (laughs) And one year I called myself spraying down some stuff and it hurt my St. Augustine, my precious St. Augustine. And I said, nope, won't be doing that again. Won't do it again. You see, if God did not care about us, he would have burnt down the whole field. If I didn't care about my yard, I would have just burnt down the whole thing. But I care about it, so I won't won't burn down the whole thing. God, he has not burnt down the whole field, has he? He did not burn up the good because the bad was present. Has he? As you have heard me say repeatedly the past few weeks, the Lord, he again, did not plant you to not see you grow up. He did not plant you uh, to not see you to, to bear any fruit. So, yes, the Lord allows the bad to grow with the good. Because, again, he has that desire for you to grow and to keep on growing until you reach your full potential until you, and so that you can bear that fruit, the fruit that is holy and righteous, as we saw in our Sunday school lesson, the fruit that is a giver of life. And that life is spiritually. Now the fear that, that many of us have is that the bad that is growing in the field right beside us will hinder us will stop us from being able to grow will stop us from being able to bear any fruit. But again, I want to remind you today that God knows exactly what he is doing. The Lord, his thoughts are not like our thoughts. I remind you again this Sunday. His ways are not like our ways. I again remind you today. We will complain that the world is getting worse and worse all of the time, right? But I want you to know today, I want you to realize today again, that there is still some good, there is still some righteousness that is growing in the world. We, we must realize today that there is some good, there is some righteousness that has taken root in the world today. That is growing in the field. Yes, there is bad in the world, but God has given to all who are righteous the food, that fertilizer that we need in order to grow so that we can reach the fullness of Christ. Did you hear that? As Paul wrote to the Ephesians, we should not be as children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. Because God has allowed us to grow to our full potential, we can stand tall in our world today. And we can again bear much fruit. Again, we can bear fruit that is worthy to be harvested by the Lord. 
again, I tell you today that we are a testimony of the Lord, of his gardening skills. We are a testimony of his pruning. We are a testimony of the Lord's work. We, I tell you today, who are of sincere and true faith, we are the harvest of the Lord. Jesus, he once looked out at the field with his disciples and he said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. He said to them, lift up your eyes, look out at the field. In the field, they are already white for harvest, is what Jesus said. You see, a field that is whitened means that the grain, it has grown and it has reached its full potential. It is ripe. It is ready to be harvested. The Lord He's up in heaven looking out at that field saying, oh, there's some white. There's some white in the field. It is time to go and harvest. If you were to see wheat in the field when it is ready to be harvested, that wheat will look white. That is in the field. Any tares that, again, was growing with the wheat, the, the wheat has separated itself from the tares. It no longer looks like it. Mm -hmm. See that wheat, it has grown, it has matured. Mm -hmm. And so where it was once green, it ain't green anymore. Mm -hmm. right. It's ripe. Mm -hmm. The tear, it still look like nothing but a weed. Mm -hmm. It is easily distinguishable now. And at the time of the harvest, the owner of the field, Jesus said that in the 30th verse, will send out the reapers into the field and say, hey, Go and do it. It's time to harvest. Jesus said that he's going to send the reapers into the field and they're going to gather together the tars in bundles to be burned. Mm -hmm. See, by the time of the harvest, again, the wheat and the tares, they're not going to look the same anymore. And so Jesus, he explained again to the disciples that on the day of the harvest, he said he's going to send his angels out into the world, into the field, to gather out of his kingdom, that again is the earth, all things that offend and practice lawlessness. All things that practice lawlessness. All things that offend. All things that transgress against the Lord is of sin. All of those that are in the field that are transgressing against the Lord that are being disobedient, we know them as sinners. Mm -hmm. All right. See, the soul of the fully convicted sinner, it looks drastically different from the soul of the one who is fully convicted of faith, mm -hmm. who is righteous. Not only that, but the fruit born now from the one who is righteous, the mm -hmm. one who is of sincere and true faith, it is drastically different from the fruit of the sinner. Mm -hmm. The fruit of righteousness, holiness, it is drastically different than the fruit that is of the world. Mm -hmm. Like I said in the Sunday school lesson, the good of the world, it is different from the good that is holy and righteousness. Mm -hmm. The fruit of the world, its goodness, the joy that it may bring, it is drastically different than the joy and the happiness that the fruit of the spirit that is holy and righteous can bring. Those who the devil's doctrine took root in and grew to be a weed in God's field, the fruit that they produce is rotten. It is corrupt. The Lord going to look at that fruit and say, I don't want anything to do with that. That's what God is going to do one day. The reapers, the angels that go out into the field, they're going to look at that fruit. You know how you are when you go to the store and you pick up and you look at the fruit and you start checking to see if it's ripe. If it ain't you, what you do, you put it back, don't you? But that fruit that's good and ripe, guess what you do with it? You take it, you put it in the bag and it go back home with you, don't you? Lord, like I said earlier, 
He's not going to gather up weeds and he's certainly not going to be gathering up any fruit that's rotten. The fruit that is rotten will not be part of the harvest of God. In other words, the sinner will not be a part of God's harvest. Mm -hmm. They will not be taken into the Lord's barn. The Lord has determined that the weeds of the field are to be cast into the furnace of fire. Again, the place that again elsewhere in scripture is known as outer darkness. We call it hell. The harvest of God, I want you to understand today, it is made up of the fruit that is holy and righteous. It is the fruit of the true and the sincere, the faithful, the genuine believers. Those who will be of the harvest of God are those that the word of God took root in. The word of God, it grew in and it produced that fruit that is holy and righteous. It produced that fruit that is of the spirit that the Lord will easily be able to notice, will easily be able to tell. It is the fruit that is love. It is the fruit that is joy. It is the fruit that is peace. It is fruit that is low suffering. The fruit that is kindness, the fruit that is goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It is again, the fruit that is of the spirit. And the Lord is going to recognize that fruit right away. And he's going to say that fruit, it is good. That is the fruit that I want in my born. As I asked last week, I asked today, are you bearing the fruit that is holy and righteous? If you desire to be part of the harvest of God, I tell you today that you must first wake up. You must wake up out of that sleep. You must wake up to the light of the world. After that, after you have awakened, you must then take in the word of God so that you can grow into holiness and righteousness and bear the fruit that is holy and righteous as well. In doing this, all of us as true and faithful believers, we are going to be separated from the tares in the field. We're going to be separated by our fruit, the fruit that is holy and righteous. Through our faithfulness and the Lord's tender love and care, we will flourish in our, the world. We will flourish in this world and we will bear fruit that is able to give life, fruit that is able to save souls. Fruit that again, if one was to eat of it, they would taste and see that the Lord is good and they will begin to bear fruit that is holy and righteous so that they too can be gathered up in the harvest of the Lord and gathered into his born. If again, you desire today to be of the harvest of God, be of sincere faith. Genuinely believe in him, bear good fruit. And I tell you, you will be in the Lord's born and the Lord's barn is heaven. Amen. 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 Amen.